It is Tacky Talk time here on Quincy Access Television with State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy. How are you, Tacky? Doing good, Joe. Good to see you on a Tuesday for a change, uh, the 26th of July, and a uh, much uh, cooler day. We finally get a break from the heat wave. Yes, uh, it's only going to be in the 80s <laughs> instead of in the 90s, so that, that'll feel just very refreshing. <laughs> well, it's been walking like in, walking like in soup the uh, the last several days. I try to get things done, like, you know, shopping, I mean, life things, and it's been really walking in soup. Really has been. It's unhealthy, too, uh, especially for folks who have uh, respiratory issues. So this will be a nice relief, although I'm sure uh, it'll be back uh, in short order. <laughs> well, it's it's uh, people are complaining about the uh, slow warm up of the summer and that uh, now it's here. Most of us can't get to the can't wait to get to the fall. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, exactly. <laughs> exactly, but you're absolutely correct. The air quality has been really hard, especially ext- extremely dense air that holds on to pollution because the water particles in the air will hold on to particulates. And uh, folks with a little more respiratory challenges will, will find it a little harder to breathe and they should definitely take it slower. As we talked about before, I mean, you know, stay indoors, stay cool. If you've got an air filtration system, definitely take advantage of using your air filter uh, purifier systems. And, um, you know, again, I mean, don't leave your cars, pets, kids, you uh, in cars, uh, even though it's going to be in the 80s, as you point out, it's, it's still dangerous to do so. Oh, yeah. It gets very hot in a vehicle very, very quickly, for sure. Uh, last week in July also means the last week of the formal legislative session on Beacon Hill, right? It is. We're still operating on emergency rules uh, from COVID-19. There seemed no reason to change from emergency rooms, uh, I'm sorry, emergency rules once we reach a more living with the virus this past, you know, January to, to April. So this means that, you know, we can continue to uh, have formal sessions if we desire to end of a uh, formal of uh, end of the legislative cycle. But uh, the decision has been made by both House and leadership to avoid that unless there's an extreme emergency to do so. Uh, that means we're going to try to operate as if, you know, pre-COVID schedule is what we're trying to maintain. Uh, as a result, formal sessions will end uh, uh, midnight, uh, August 1st, uh, July 31st is the last day. And we're um, you know, to try to get our uh, things done then. Now, again, a formal session means we all convene and we actually take votes. Uh, informal sessions by law require to happen every 72 hours, uh, which means you can move bills by unanimous consent on a voice vote. There's no need for a roll call vote. And uh, there's still opportunities to move uh, legislation uh, after uh, July 31st in informal sessions. Um, this is not necessarily unusual. Uh, we do this actually more often than people realize, especially on uh, local initiatives, uh, small technical bills, um, things that don't raise a, a larger controversy that requires a vote, um, and even small supplemental budgets, um, just strictly bill paying or transfer of accounts between one account and another account in administration. Not surprising, it's often done in an informal session. There's already an agreement between both political parties, as well as the governor's office of these small uh, trends, uh, transitory issues that doesn't really impact the taxpayers. It just moves one account to another account. It's, it's fairly routine. So, you know, we are uh, shutting down formal sessions, uh, but that is not the close of session. And, uh, you know, other pieces of legislation will keep moving forward as the, as the remaining months uh, are here to a uh, swearing in day in January. Since last we talked, uh, I believe, actually the day that we talked, there was a climate change bill that was being uh, debated, and I think it uh, got reported out, did it not? Yeah, we uh, uh, a deal broke uh, last week. Amazing what a president does to uh, motivate uh, our counterparts in the Senate to to cut a deal faster uh, and uh, reached a fairly good compromise in my mind. As a reminder, folks, I mean, we... Working this business, you're never going to get everything you want. There's multiple parties of interest, but you need to come to an agreement to move the greater issue forward. And, uh, you know, Chairman Roy, Jeff Roy out of Franklin, uh, the House Telecommunication Utilities Energy Chair did an incredibly good job on this, as well as working with the Minority Leader Brad Jones um, from North Reading. I mean, he he was remarkable, uh, contributed to this entire um, you know, process uh, from the House standpoint to... Um, you know, support the House position uh, throughout the bill. Uh, you know, we have uh, Senator Barrett, who's the House Senate Chair of Telecommunication Utilities Energy, as well as uh, Cindy Cream, the Majority Leader, and uh, 
uh, Senator Bruce Tarr, you know, those are three Senate conferences. Uh, interesting enough, I actually worked uh, uh, in the Senate at the same time both uh, Senator Tarr and Senator Cream were there. I remember Senator Cream's predecessor, Senator Lois Pines, give me an idea how I'm dating myself. As, as soon as I get to a certain age in this gig, you start to date yourself really a lot in the state. As we can start naming predecessors uh, too many, too many seats deep. Um, but I mean, it was also great to work with folks that I've known for many years uh, on this. And uh, the governor's in the driver's seat. Uh, well, actually, no, he's not. We, we got it to him on the 21st of uh, July, which means if he vetoes it, it would be the 31st of July. And uh, if he should do so, the legislature uh, will be in formal session still to override his veto. So we're kind of in a waiting game at this point to see, um, you know, what he's, what he's going to do. What are some of the highlights of the bill, Jackie? What does it actually do? Well, the big one, of course, is the uh, procurement of large wind uh, energy off of Block Island. Um, the federal government has opened up a number of, uh, well, essentially open water, which is owned by the federal government because <laughs> it's uh, inside uh, federal waters, uh, to, um, to long-term lease. And uh, you're not going to build a windmill if no one's going to use your power. I mean, you need a customer before you build so, you know, this again opens the procurement process for Massachusetts to um, ask for bids by big wind uh, companies to um, get a bid process to collect another 2,000, I think, 600 megawatts of power. So, you know, it's a big deal uh, to continue our uh, shift to uh, big wind as our baseline energy supply. And uh, we worked out ability to ensure that, you know, we're going to get the best rate possible. Uh, not just take the best bid possible. So one of the sticking points between the House and Senate involved the so-called cap on the bid. They wanted, the Senate wanted to cap uh, the bid process to whatever it was in the original bid process in 2018. Well, it's 2022 and it's different, right? Life has changed. So, you know, the interest, of course, is not to just get uh, wind power, but also get wind power at a good price uh, in the current marketplace. So, you know, that, that is kind of way we, we approach the issue in the end is that, you know, um, as part of the uh, division of uh, Department of Energy Resources and you know, going through Department of Public Utilities as well, you know, when the Department of Energy Resources looks at the, uh, puts the bid prices out, you know, we're looking at the best value for us, not necessarily just the lowest bid. Uh, so that's, uh, it, it makes some sense, uh, but we also don't want to leave one at the table. And in fact, Massachusetts uh, consumes about 49% of all power in New England. Uh, you know, should be a valuable uh, consumer uh, for big wind to get a competitive price. So that, that's that's the biggest part of the bill. Um, other parts include, include using uh, money for economic development purposes. Uh, we want to uh, issue about $35 million in tax credits for uh, industry that are going to have direct uh, impact in terms of windmill construction, meaning that you're going to actually be a manufacturing facility, an assembling facility, fabrication facility, um, you know, you have to actually be directly related. And we also put some money to workforce training for new jobs into the future associated with Big Wind. Okay. Yeah, no, and I would think the government, the governor rather, would be um, uh, acceptable to this. It, it, was it not him that set a goal for the state to have zero emissions by, what, 2050? Um, yeah, he did. The Paris Accord did. We did. I mean, it's kind of like this strange date that people just picked out of thin air with no real rhyme or reason of how to do it. I mean, I love these dates, but I mean, the reality is that uh, you only can move as quickly as the power becomes available. Yeah. So, I mean, the objective is to uh, wean ourselves off of uh, natural gas because, you know, honestly, it's really natural gas and stuff. The fossil fuel, I mean, we use no oil and almost no coal. I mean, you know, in energy generation, unless you get a huge peaker situation where we need power desperately, right? Yeah, you know, and baseline load on a normal, you know, non, you know, heat wave day. Yeah. Um, we we should, you know, uh, uh, it's all natural gas, so we should try to get off natural gas. But to do so, I mean, it's it's very logical. Before you take natural gas off, you need to put something in to replace it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so. Uh, this is like common sense and I never understand why we say this. People look at me like in shock. I mean, I've done this more than once thing. Yeah, what you do is you take fossil fuels offline when we get a renewable power online. Then everyone looks at me like, like it's like a revelation of like, what? I mean, this is like common sense, people. 
but it's it's amazing when I talk to folks sometimes, and it's you know particularly advocates. I, I say things like that, and they look at me like seventeen heads. It's 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 weird. Um, well, I'm sure I'm sure it's not popular in the fossil fuel industry <laughs> to say things like that. <laughs> Well, I mean, the fossil fuel industry is is a dying industry. I mean, you know, they maybe have uh, 400 less years of life left in the industry. This is a, not a uh, reality just on climate change with these industries. It's actually a reality of having a corporation uh, live for another thousand years, so to speak. You know, corporations are designed to outlive human beings. I mean, mm. you know, you look at you know, even if you look at like family restaurants that have been around since the 1880s, like the Union Oyster House, for example. You know, there's, there's an example of a corporate entity that has outlived, you know, a lot of human beings sure. um, to maintain, you know, a business that's there with new owners. So, you know, the uh, you know, fossil fuel industry uh, has to pivot. They do not have a choice. Uh, there's plenty of new technology. There's plenty of renewable uh, R&D out there that uh, they're going to make a substantial financial investment in. They already have and they continue well to try to... Mm-hmm. Uh, also uh, be ahead of the game and do acquisitions of uh, renewable power sources as being part of an um, international uh, corporation. So we actually had a conversation, interestingly, with one uh, renewable energy supply, relatively small player uh, in this in this industry. But, uh, you know, they're a growing uh, purchaser of uh, renewable energy projects. And uh, not surprising, uh, I won't name the company, but one of the big fossil fuel companies scooped them up. You know, looking at their portfolio of future growth, and had a lot of faith in the team that was there on, on their uh, investments and acquisitions of renewable energy uh, projects, whether it be an investment in or a purchase went outright, um, that they thought it was worth a long term risk mm-hmm. uh, to to buy a company that uh, knows what they're doing. And uh, you'd be surprised if you guys look, start looking at these energy conglomerates. It's like how much of the portfolio now is really on nuclear, wind, hydro, um, and uh, also investment in new R&D uh, companies that seem to have viability. And all of them are already invested in battery technology. Oh, yeah. I mean, they've, all, they've already all pretty much rebranded themselves as energy companies as opposed to you know oil or natural gas companies. So, I mean, even if government doesn't act, the private industry is going to push the agenda forward. Yeah, and these companies are international companies. So, you know, when they uh, when it involves energy, I mean, they do uh, have investments on a global level where the, there is allowance for private investment in energy generation. So Europe in particular has uh, industry uh, energy companies that are just really globally oriented. Um, and as we learned from the Ukraine war, uh, you know, Fossil fuel energy companies, you know, are a global uh, entity, uh, whether it be a state owned company like in Russia, you know, probably owned companies in Britain, it, it really doesn't matter. There's um, just just so, f- so much diversity in their uh, portfolios, they really touch every part of the planet. Yeah, I mean, it, it would seem to me that um, government might want to focus on investing in upgrading the grid, you know, the actual infrastructure that the you know, private companies may take advantage of incentives like that. Yeah, this is a, an ongoing conversation. President Biden brought, brought this up uh, a few times uh, in his uh, talks about energy, about the national transmission system being, you know, really, really old. And uh, Massachusetts has one of the oldest grid systems in the country. And it's logical when you think about it, because, you know, electricity is really about 120 years old in terms of, you know, residential use. And, uh, you know, we, you know, got it first before uh, other parts west of us, right? So, you know, the grid systems moving westbound, not to say they're that much better shape, but I mean, they're a little bit younger than us. Right. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of stuff underground as people like not to look at poles, but there's different consequences of underground wiring. It's hard to get at. Uh, you have to dig up a lot of streets to replace. In some cases, not all cases, uh, it can be extremely dangerous to be down in a manhole. Um, As we've seen uh, regarding the uh, explosion, um, actually near my office uh, by Ashburn Place. Um, So, you know, there's a lot of things regarding, uh, uh, you know, utility work. But the utility uh, infrastructure is paid by rate payers, not by taxpayers, meaning that your electric bill and gas bills pay for the pipes and wires and maintenance and all that stuff. 
So um, if the, if there's going to be an investment on, in the distribution system, we're going in, in transmission system, we need federal assistance. But a state could probably put up, you know, some bonds of a few hundred million dollars, you know, maybe even a billion dollars. I mean, that, that just doesn't cover uh, enough. Uh, and we have to give it to a privately owned corporation, which, you know, we've done things like this before, uh, biotechnology, but mostly in infrastructure development around biotech and tax credits for biotech, not actually like being an investor in biotech. You can buy shares of biotech to give you bond money to use. Uh, so it's really more of the, you know, of the public infrastructure components. So for us to give tax dollars direct to utilities, um, whether it be a bond loan or cash, is kind of a real tricky situation because it's, you know, inv- still investment in a private company. Yeah, if the yeah, federal yeah. government, yeah, if the federal government through FERC, Besides the poor, uh, you know, federal tax dollars directly into the grid, uh, it'll be a little bit easier because you, know, you run it through FERC to be a regulatory process. It'd be somewhat of a uniform system uh, versus a patchwork. I, I, I really have a great answer on this one because it's like, you know, do we create tax credits for utility companies to do this? Do we give them bond money as a loan? I mean, I, I'm not sure what the answer is, but either yeah, way, no, I, I see the I see the conundrum. Yeah, yeah, it's very tricky uh, to yeah. deal with it. Um, but you know, the bill does have a grid modernization study component, um, and we do participate in the six New England states uh, energy purchasing, as well as look at the um, bigger picture ISO New England six state picture as part of that as well. So the bill has some uh, requirements that we go into and participate in studies uh, on a multi-state level as well as domestic, just our state. Yeah. But as, as you guys can tell, it's it's tricky for the government to get directly involved in utility companies you know no, I, I understand uh you know maybe uh here here's a bombshell tacky the state of massachusetts uh uh electric company <laughs> <laughs> well people uh remember you know old mass electric you know edison i mean you know they're gone we're really down to two utility electric companies which is a national grid and uh, nstar you know people may remember things like commonwealth electric way back oh no, sure yeah yeah so uh, what used to be a, you know, few, a dozen plus electrical utilities are now down to two. Uh, gas is a slightly more diverse. I believe there's four, was it five? I think just Berkshire, um, uh, NSTAR, NGRID, uh, Liberty is the one in the South Coast. And I may be forgetting a couple. I know Berkshire, I'm um, sorry, Blackstone got bought out. Finally, the family retired. It's the smallest gas company, I think, in the country. Uh, they only served one town, Blackstone. Right. Yeah. Um, but and, uh, I think you're thinking of uh, Eversource. Yeah, Eversource. Um, I'm trying to think of anyone else because I know that uh, Columbia left after the disaster in Lawrence. Um, it's as you guys guys can tell, it's been a little while since I had to name utility companies since they left the left the AG's office. It was not a priority to remember where they all were. Right. Um, right. Yeah. But also, um, it's an interstate issue. Anything you do uh, in yeah. Massachusetts regarding electrical grid, uh, whether it be energy or gas, you know, has a ripple effect to our neighbors, neighboring states. It's the nature of how electricity works. I mean, the grid systems from Halifax and I think it's like 20 some odd states. So an electron in Ohio or Halifax, you know, we don't know where that electron is. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Does the bill also um, include um, electric vehicle incentives? Yeah, we uh, do some incentives for electrical vehicles based on the price of the vehicle. Don't ask me off the top of my head what the prices are, but uh, we're looking at vehicles in the $55,000 range. And I think we're looking at uh, tax incentives about $3,500. Um, you know, the goal is to obviously incentivize people to uh, you know move to uh, for electric vehicles. Uh, and uh, once there's a sufficient customer uh, demand, uh, you know, other electric vehicle technology infrastructure will follow it. As I like to say, you know, gas station did not, was not built before cars were built. Cars were built before the gas station. Right. And uh, not surprising, you know, horse and buggy um, uh, shops started uh, to become ga- horse and buggy and gas and then uh, fully gas. And, uh, you know, and of course, that's not the case for every community. But I'm just pointing out an example of a uh, ability for uh, industry to pivot. Uh, from one uh, mode of transportation, other, um, you know, as part of the economy changes. So uh, same thing with electric cars. You need to get a certain uh, level of critical mass of consumers. And, uh, you know, as we pointed out, fossil fuel industry uh, is already pivoting. Um, and I'm a big believer that, 
some point down the road, uh, the car fran, you know, the, the gas station franchises, or the gas station independent shops, you know, going to have to make the pivot uh, to electric vehicle charging at some stage. Uh, you have to do it safely. Electricity and gas in the same space is a little tricky to deal with, but also the big issues uh, impact on your electric bill. And what do I mean by that? Well, you have to build brand new electrical infrastructure for electrical vehicle charging in large quantities. It's one thing to have one charging station. It's another thing when you have 50 within, within you know, a quarter square mile, so to speak. And same thing with electrical charging at home. We actually have a lot of stress on the wires outside your house. So that, you know, as you pointed out, you know, we need to have grid uh, infrastructure upgrade. Uh, electrical vehicles will put stress on that in large volumes. Right now, it's not enough large volumes, but if you go, you know, if you add, you know, 1.5 million electric cars to the grid at any moment, you know, it actually defeats uh, energy efficiency, which is, I've been, I've been a proponent of, which is reducing demand. Reducing demand helps the grid immensely as well as your pocketbook and our need to uh, use uh, fossil fuels. Um, so it's an interesting thing. Again, as I talked about, you know, take out one power out, one point out power in, you know, electric vehicles in particular, it's, you know, we got to get uh, ourselves ready for that. And that means rate payers got to pick up the cost associate for future uh, upgrades, which is why we have a grid modernization study as part of the wind and climate change bill. And, you know, fully weighted Department of Public Utilities you know, has been looking at this for, for years as well as the utility companies. And, you know, this will be an ongoing conversation for, for years to come. Sure. So what uh, what other bills are pending, uh, at least in in, um, in your belly wagon, Zachy, you'd like to see approved this week? Well, I don't have too much in my belly wag. Anything's the way, thankfully. I mean, most of my bills are technical bills we've talked about in the past, like you know, the veterinarian renewal license date changes. I mean, we, we can move those bills in the informal session. I've been in conversation with the Speaker's Office about my, my low-hanging fruit that no one's going to object to bills, but the little technical ones. Um, you know, that being said, uh, you know, we're watching out for uh, other conference committee reports. I mean, the uh, Conference Committee on Economic Development just was formed this week. They're going to have to do a rapid turnaround. Uh, we're still waiting for sports betting. Uh, we have a mental health bill. Uh, we have a veterans bill. Uh, we have a transportation infrastructure bill. <laughs> um, uh, we, what else do we got going on? We're waiting to see what the Senate really does with the cannabis um, social justice bill, I think is a way to call it. It's you know to reform the cannabis industry to have some uh, sm better small de business development as opposed to just being done by big uh, venture capitalists. So, uh, you know, we're waiting to see what the Senate wants to do with that kind of stuff. Um, there's some, you know, healthcare stuff out there that I'm not sure what's going to happen regarding pharmacy prices and, you know, commu uh, you know community hospitals were actually addressed as part of um, ARPA and the last uh, economic development uh, bill. So a lot of the community hospital stuff has been kind of addressed, but, you know, we're looking at like pharmacy pricing and things like that, which I'm not quite sure where we are. Um, obviously, uh, the role protections to keep our doctors from being, you know, taken away from us by other states uh, will be on the governor's desk today. That, that bill uh, came out of conference, conference committee last night, and it's going to we'll vote and send it to the governor today. And of course, uh, the governor still has the budget, uh, and he has to give us our vetoes by tomorrow, I believe, because we sent it up on a Monday. He has 10 days. So it's so tomorrow, does he Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Thursday, he vetoes. We'll come back from the governor and the budget. So we'll be working on those actually probably through the weekend uh, since the governor has to meet before midnight on Thursday to drop that on us. Um, what else is there? This is a lot going on right now. <laughs> and an amendment passed by the Senate to bring back happy hour, Jackie. <laughs> yeah, uh, as you all know, I'm the chair of the committee on alcohol and uh, I've uh, stopped. Uh, we'll get to the technicalities of how I do things, but I mean, you know, I prevented the movement of continuing of happy hour bills in my committee. Um, and uh, there was um, a, a, not a well done attempt, let's be polite, on trying to put happy hours in the ballot. I mean, that was a ballot question that, that was formed, but I mean, they're going into signatures and it was not really a true ballot initiative campaign. Uh, so the Senate adopted as part of the economic development bill uh, to allow uh, communities individually decide if they should have happy hours. So it's by local option. There's a huge problem with this because, you know, when it comes to alcohol licensing, we actually have a fairly uniform system. I mean, while state, each city and town has the ability to determine the hours operations for alcohol industry folks, we pretty much try to keep the alcohol industry fairly uniform. And uh, now we're going to a little bit ancient history, but I mean, during the 
uh, 1990s, the late 1990s, we tried to resolve some of the issues regarding border communities where, uh, you know, places like New Hampshire and, and Rhode Island would be able to have liquor stores open on Sundays. Massachusetts blue laws, remember those things? Um, sure. You know, wouldn't allow liquor stores open on Sundays. So we created a situation where you had a 50 mile border. If you're within 50 miles of a, of a border, your liquor store could open on Sundays if they choose to open on Sundays. And that became a bit of a problem because any uh, liquor store uh, at 51 miles from the border is competing against this one in state. So ultimately, this was not a good idea. Uh, and we just made it uniform throughout the state uh, to allow liquor stores the option opening on, on Sundays. Now, even though you have a local option saying that, you know, we, you know, we authorize happy hours, each individual restaurant may not want to do a happy hour. It is not cost effective for a restaurant. Alcohol is very expensive. Uh, Right now, it's pretty expensive because supply chain's a mess. It was really right. cheap, but really cheap that everywhere and everything was closed uh, because people were just trying to get rid of inventory. So it's amazing how in, uh, in in less than two years, how the market shifted really quickly from 2020 uh, shutdown to uh, 2022 inflation. Yep. Um, simple supply and demand like, right there. Yeah, Simple supply and demand. And it becomes like a price war between restaurants and happy hour where it's, there's no winner for the restaurant. So there'd be, you know, it becomes like this price war in a geographic zone. If you're in a sparse community, you know, why would you need happy hour to begin with? And you know, if you're a place where you have limited options, but you have a lot of options, if you start a price war, there's going to be no win among the restaurants. Right. And, and not only that, but I mean, uh, what's to prevent one customer in a happy hour community from imbibing and then driving to a non-happy hour community and causing a problem? Yeah, this is uh, very much a generational issue in the state house, uh, I've noted. So uh, those of us who are old enough uh, remember, or at least sadly had a classmate in school uh, die of drunk driving, uh, generally uh, underage drinking. Um, in some cases, other cases, you know, they're coming home with friends and family, um, you know, even at like eight o'clock and they got killed by a drunk driver, uh, you know, throughout the 80s. Um, into early 90s. And, uh, you know, that's what MAD and SAD and these other organizations became heavily invested in our schools regarding uh, alcohol and now uh, into substance abuse issues beyond just alcohol. Uh, and this was a common occurrence in Massachusetts. Yes. Um, and I'm waiting for my full 2020 numbers and 2021 numbers on um, driving um, incidences. But I mean, during COVID lockdown, and we, you know, eventually I take out alcohol as part of it. I mean, uh, substance abuse drunk driving cases were low, but when you look at the ratio of drivers, it was high. Yeah. So even though the raw number is low, well, you have to think about how many cars were on the road. And uh, the ratio, that number is, is pretty high, but I need to see the final numbers. Triple A had some preliminary ones uh, on the 2020, but I need to see the 2021 numbers to see that a good comparison. So, you know, a lot of uh, younger folks are kind of like, oh, Uber and Lyft solves this problem. And I tell folks, well, we had cap taxi cabs and a much less full MBTA where, uh, you know, people could get on the train and there are cabs galore. So having uh, the Uber or Lyft argument doesn't make sense no. uh, uh, if, if you live through that era. And uh, amazingly, uh, when we stopped happy hours in Massachusetts, drunk driving fatalities went down too, especially uh, after work hours. Yep. You know, they, they, uh, that time period really just was reduced immensely. Combined have better education, uh, stronger drunk driving laws, uh, police and uh, you know taking full uh, full force of the law on on catching folks, and of course bar bar bartender tip training uh, on top of that to identify and overserve. I mean it's a combination of factors that um, stemming from the ban of uh, happy hour has really reduced the number of drunk driving instances in, in the state uh, since the 80s by ratio of vehicles. So, you know, it really is interesting inside this, in this conversation. It really is age-driven. Right, yeah. Uh, folks like you and I remember those times and, and lost people close to us to drunk driving-related incidents. Um, since then, you know, as you mentioned, the... the <laughs> The instances of that have gone way down, so younger people don't know what we're talking about. No, no, they, they don't, and it's it's kind of interesting. Like I said, it's it's very interesting uh, in this conversation. It's clearly a generational issue, uh, very much so, and uh, not understanding that you know all those things I described, you know, took you know twenty years to have an impact, truly an impact on reducing drunk driving. Yeah. 
So in fact, I think the senator that that uh, introduced it is of, of a younger generation. Yeah, Senator Julian Sear from the Cape. Yeah. Uh, the argument I heard, I heard listening to Grapevine, I was told that the argument is because Provincetown is a walkable uh, town uh, on restaurants that, you know, happy hours are perfectly acceptable. No, drunken mm-hmm. disorder in the middle of the street is not, an, is not acceptable to begin with. Uh, those of us who travel and watch people stumble on the streets, you know, hammered. I remember the eras of even the pubs in Southie or in Quincy or Dorchester or anywhere else, you know, people just, you know, completely blasted. Uh, you know, you know, you have your families and you're looking at that. No, no one wants that either. Right. No, I'm sure there'll be some public safety advocates that are going to come forward and remind folks of those times. <laughs> yeah. And Provincetown is a tourist community. I mean, during the summertime in particular, I mean, it's almost 200 percent the size of regular population. So the argument walking is, is not true. I mean, people do day, do day trips uh, out there to come in and come out. So actually travel long distances, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just everybody on the ferry either. Not everybody's coming off long north. So I get it. But at the same time, though, it's it's kind of a very, I'm sorry to say, Julian, it's a very limited view of how the world works. I'm sorry to tell you that on, on video. Home, this ain't Mark Crosby. So it's not like it's to be transmitted to the Cape. But uh <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Although I'm sure he's heard it face to face. I mean, yeah, as you said, you have to be a certain age. I've been around longer. I've been doing alcohol policy for a very, very long yeah. time. Well, it's, I mean, isn't it true, though, of any kind of legislation that tries to specifically target individual cities and towns? It's, it's you know, we live in a commonwealth, right? So it, it does impact the entire state. Yeah, we've done this before, too. Uh, remember smoking? Mm-hmm. Uh, restaurants that was patchwork until the state had to intervene, uh, buying cigarettes at age 21. Again, another thing that was patchwork until the state intervened. Um, one of the ones that we're going to have to look at down the road is banning NIPs. Mm-hmm. Uh, multiple communities, not that many yet, but you know, multiple communities have already started banning NIPs and liquor stores. Including um, Quincy, yeah. Including Quincy, and that's going to have to be addressed on a um, statewide level at some point down the road. Uh, there have been proposals to make them part of the bottle bill. Um mm-hmm. Mm, that may not be the solution. Um, bottle bill effectiveness um, diminishes the once you get away from dense urban. It doesn't have the same benefit advantage to do it. Um, suburban uh, communities, more sparse communities, bottle bill doesn't have the same same effect. Um, so uh, may, you know, we may be moving towards banning nips. I'm not. I can't. I'm not sure yet. Um, actually, it's not my committee overseas. That is telecom utilities and energy because it's considered part of the bottle bill and environmental recycling. It's weird. I just don't ask. It's part of that committee for some reason. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, no, we're going to have to move that direction. I mean, we've we've done uh, all kinds of things at our level to ensure uniformity because these towns just move independently on their own. Yeah, speaking of, I read a survey not too long ago, I forget who did it, um, that participation in recycling Massachusetts is, is down considerably from just a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's a little confusing, too, because uh, not all your recyclable little symbol on your plastic uh, and paper containers are recyclable um, right. uh, because uh, countries overseas don't want our trash anymore. Right. Uh, it's been real problematic uh, for communities to find companies to take all recyclable products. They only want specific recyclable products. And uh, you will, uh, to say a town will cure some financial impact for having to run recyclables. So, you know, people are looking carefully at their containers and realizing this can be recycled and this can't. And uh, recycling and trash is like a global industry. Mm-hmm. of which uh, first world countries generate the most of it, namely right. you know, guys that look like us. Uh, less wealthy countries don't generate nearly the bottom of trash that we do. And uh, they have a tendency, of course, trying to make things last a whole lot longer and less disposable. Yep. So they really have a problem with the disposal economy. I, my mind can't get around that. It's like, why are we creating disposable items for people regularly? But whatever it's the century we live in so i mean that's that's one of the big factors and uh some communities have moved to a single stream recycling where everything goes into the same container and it gets sorted out later on um like i said some inconsistencies uh, on how recycling works in terms of each community because each community uh needs to pay for it themselves as part of trash pickup so it's you know negotiated contract and 
Um, some people who may be listening to this that lives in a town where you have to take it to the dump yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you do your recycling at the dump in some cases. Yep. Um, and then you also have communities where you have to pay per bag. I mean, you have to right. pay per bag of trash. Right. Yep. And the, the, the town will bill you. Uh, so uh, garbage pickup, uh, you know, is is non, um, con when well, like non conform between communities because communities actually ones have to pay those costs. And uh, my favorite story is always ones where people, you know, you move like from Quincy to a little town and realize they have to like take the trash to the dump, you know, and suddenly they get there, there's like an extra fee they have to pay at the dump, and like, what is this? It's quite and a culture they, shock, yeah. <laughs> it is. They can't get rid of a couch easily. Um, yep. There's all kinds of like, my friends are like, what is this? I'm getting used to it. Why can't still take everything? I'm like, well, you're paying a low property tax, low service community. That's what happens. That's exactly right. Yeah, that is one of the biggest culture shocks for folks who move away from uh, communities that have full service collection. Yeah. So, I mean, this is kind of you know, part of the challenge of recycling. It's, um, it's just, a, it's, a, it's truly an economic issue at a global yeah. level. Want to switch gears a little bit, Tacky, and talk uh, international affairs? Sure, why not? We, we just moved into international trash conversation. <laughs> um, Nancy Pelosi wants to go to Taiwan. China's not happy about that. Yeah, this is a delayed trip. Nancy Pelosi was looking to go to Taiwan prior to COVID hitting, so this was not a new news. But a lot changed in the last uh, couple of years, as we know, including uh, international affairs that you know has nothing to do with the pandemic. Uh, you know the uh, um, the Hong Kong protests uh, has, for those who remember the Hong Kong protests, it was like Asian history, right? Uh, that went on essentially nearly two years and the uh, government cracked down on it and now the new national security law that makes it impossible uh, to talk about uh, the government at all uh, in a negative way, uh, at banning uh, independent newspapers, uh, trying to erase Tiananmen Square from all over the island, essentially, and then actually engaging in an international manhunt by the Chinese government to find uh, people who uh, support financially, uh, like Tiananmen Square memorials, uh, you know, is causing a lot of panic and fear in Taiwan and, and should cause panic and fear in all the neighboring countries at the moment. The, what they've done to Hong Kong, even though, yeah, it's, it's China, I mean, let's call it what it is. It's not an independent country, uh, but it had uh, the most autonomous uh, freedoms of all of China. Uh, very more Western, well, more British because it's a British colony, but I mean more Western-ish. Not, it's not American folks. It's more Western-ish because it's, mm -hmm. it's a, was a British colony. Um, you know, it's, it's freaking out a lot of folks out there, and especially uh, the Taiwanese, which uh, the Chinese government considers a rogue province, is already a property of China. And uh, the international community does not recognize Taiwan as a country, but does recognize its economic development zone, which is how we kind of skirt the international recognition issue. Um, and, uh, you know, the same what's happening in Ukraine, uh, where, right. uh, you know, the claim is you're one of us, you belong to us. Now, yeah, there is a difference. Ukraine is a sovereign nation. Not Taiwan is not a sovereign nation recognized by, by the world. But, uh, you know, they have a similar fear. And, uh, you know, since the Hong Kong protests, uh, Western countries have stepped up on uh, being outspoken regarding the treatment of, of what we consider civil liberties on an island that had been enjoying those civil liberties since the handover from the British to the, to the Chinese. And uh, Taiwan, again, is not, you know, us exactly in you know, Western country, but they do have a lot of similar Western of values, including things like freedom of press, uh, a parliamentary system of a government, they have a mm -hmm. democratic republic. Um, you know, they have a free commerce system, they're part of international banking industry. Um, they do have agreements regarding uh, uh, true freedom of travel uh, in and out of the country, you know, whether you require a visa, uh, you know, freedom of travel and also international uh, reciprocation of driver's license. Massachusetts allows Taiwanese uh, residents and uh, that live here, I'm going to say Taiwanese folks that are residents of Massachusetts to ex use their uh, Taiwanese driver's license to get a Massachusetts driver's license. No, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Lots of, yeah, we actually quite a few countries. There's a list online you can look uh, because they uh, have uh, sufficient uh, driving standards at home and driving education that meets our, our requirements that we're, we will do that. So as long as you don't have like, you know, a bunch of things that make you lose your license at home, you'll be fine getting your license here. They yank your license in Taiwan. You're not getting one here. 
Right. right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, in many ways, you know, it's, it's um, like Japan and South Korea, uh, you know, uh, Singapore. Um, and I know that there's trouble in the governments of Malaysia, in Indonesia, if you look at the news, they got some, uh, they got some issues, but I mean, there are parliamentary systems, so they're democratic republics. Mm-hmm. So Nancy Pelosi arriving to be the third highest ranking official in the U.S., right? The president, vice president, and speaker of the House is the order of secession. And uh, we've had U.S. senators and congressmen already go over to Taiwan mobile times uh, over the course of the last decade. But having uh, someone as high ranking, uh, because I think the last one that went there was Newt Gingrich. Uh, that was like oh, wow. a long time ago. The third highest ranking uh, in terms of the Constitution official to go to uh, Taiwan uh, you know, creates more credibility for Taiwan being in, you know, a more of an independent sovereign nation. This won't sit well with the Chinese government, who feels that uh, any uh, foreign entity that shows up, um, you know, particularly a major trade partner, ma- major defense provider, uh, shows up, uh, you know, undermines their authority in the country. And this right. is a visit. This isn't like a vacation trip. She's going there as an official state visit. Oh yeah, oh yeah, um, and yeah, they've they've uh, put a pretty strong response out to, to that. So it'd be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, anytime the U.S. government sends high-ranking officials to anywhere, it legitimizes more of uh, the government that's there, which is why uh, there's a lot of caution, particularly with the president, on where the president goes, because if this is the thing about Donald Trump and in North Korea that was mind-boggling for me because it was you know all you're doing is creating legitimacy for a government that basically you know murders people on a regular basis for doing nothing wrong other than you know looking at him the wrong way so you know when trump uh, met you know kim jong-un you know all he did was give him more legitimacy among the north korean people that he stands on equal footing with their with the evil American empire, right? I mean, that's that's how they look at it. And that's the propaganda he puts like with the evil American power that West is trying to crush us. Look, I'm with the U.S. president. I'm staying on equal footing as the most powerful nation in the world, a little hermit country. Yeah, and that's how he sells it at home. And he created legitimacy that really we shouldn't encourage. Um, Absolutely, but there is, like you say, the propaganda that the only that they only see. That's all they are allowed to see and uh, and allowed to believe. Yeah, and as soon as uh, that propaganda met uh, Kim Jong Un's needs, uh, he started testing missiles again pretty quickly, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and reactivated his nuclear program. So, I mean, you know, I mean, this is like common sense in my mind, but I mean, mm-hmm. you know, again, I mean, it's also. Domestic politics, as I said multiple times, a lot of stuff that you see in the news regarding the behavior of international affairs has nothing to do with us. It's everything to do with internal politics, whether to maintain their seats of power or address economic crisis. But more times than not, is to maintain their seats of power. Yep. Everyone needs a good boogeyman uh, at, uh, to sell at home uh, to maintain your position. Nothing like you know causing fear to to ask for stability, right? Not not unusual political behavior. So we, I mean, we're not, we do this too in the U.S. I mean, it's not like the U.S. hasn't done this as well. Create bullying so people uh, will, you know, support certain domestic policies. Saddam um, Hussein, right, is a good example. Saddam Hussein, the yellow scare, the red scare, um, you know, the Mexican scare. <laughs> uh, you know, now you have replacement theory scare. You know, uh, you have all these scares. Uh, what they are in the end is to push an agenda for people to maintain power in a local level. Yeah. And, and it's easy to pick on a foreign a government or foreign people because of their receipt. I mean, I'll tell you right now, Joe Schmo, Chinese person, you know, in China does not care about what is going on over here. They're more concerned about inflation like we are, putting food on the table. I mean, and if the government says that we're evil, sure, why not? Right. It's it, What does it mean to that person? Right. Oh, yeah. You know, okay, well, keep, you know, we want, I'm afraid I don't want to deal with, you know, American imperialists. All right, fine. Well, we'll support the government that keeps us safe, right? Sounds familiar, right? This is what happens here, too. It's not unusual behavior among, among uh, politicians and government officials to try to maintain power, push public policies that may be unpopular. Um, so that's kind of the whole Taiwan issue. I mean, you know, uh, they're right now doing drills, they react, you know, re- they've, uh, uh, put into their mandatory uh, military training requirement, more stringent requirements they ever had before. 
Uh, they've made a mass amount of purchases of anti-missile defense um, mm. in the U.S. Um, uh, they've uh, increased the military spending uh, and will do so in the next five years. Um, and they've ramped up, you know, obviously international uh, recognition in terms of like, you know, maintaining relations. And again, again, 50% of all uh, microchips on the planet are made in Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And they're not shy about reminding people of that. Don't, don't, don't let us get bombed. You're going to lose your microchips. And given the fact that we've already felt the supply chain impact for two years on shortage of chips, the idea of bombing an island that makes half of our chips, just saying. I think cars are expensive now. Just wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get used yeah. to the iPhone. You've been using that for a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So part of the reason why, why I brought up because it does have an impact um, here at home for sure. Yeah. Um, as we learned through a pandemic, you know, we're a global economy. And, uh, you know, law of economics says they create specialties. It's more efficient to have specialties around the world than trying to be, uh, you know, jack of all trade. We're not as efficient. So, yeah, Taiwan is important to us, uh, not necessarily just a, you know, friend. And we do have a lot of people from Taiwan that live here in Massachusetts, the largest concentration is lo- located in the city of Newton. Um, but also, uh, you know, selfishly, let's be selfish a bit, you know, uh, regarding international trade, um, they, you know, they're a big part of our economy, not just microchips, but also medicine, food. Um, you know, we export a lot of food over there. Um, you know, Costco's there. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's, it's a hub point for many businesses to uh, access Asia. Now that Hong Kong has become much more challenging, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Taiwan uh, has uh, really uh, continued to bloom as a, as a location, as a hub port. And uh, we do have a nonstop from Boston to Taiwan. Running up against the clock today, Techie, but um, we should let folks know how to get a hold of you and if you'll be available after the session ends. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> I would like to be less available after the session ends for at least for a little while. Um, but, you know, obviously we're always reachable at 617-722-2370, 617-722-2370. This is a new phone number. I know reminding folks two months afterwards, but you'd be surprised if you remember the old phone number, including myself. <laughs> My email box is a little tamer now. Tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, T-A-C-K-E-Y dot C-H-A-N at mahouse.gov. Um, State Representative Tacky Chan Facebook. Um, we're not being as busy on that right now because we're trying to get our press releases out to the Quincy Sun as more bills kind of you know, hit. Um, we've been really trying to get our news into the local paper. Um, as quick as we can, we're going to make poor Bob a little crazy over there because we're trying to get these releases out to him. Uh, the problem of crush of a session is we, tr- we try to have a lot of news. Um, and then, of course, Tacky Chan.org needs an update. We've just been, we've been drowning right now. So we haven't got a chance to do updates. So we'll, we'll get there. And obviously those who want to have a newsletter, you know, HouseNet Community Council, you know, I'm in their bulletin once a month. So, you know, if you feel uh, like helping out a local organization, you know, please subscribe uh, to the HouseNet Community Council's bulletin. Um, you know, you'll find me in there too. Excellent. Maybe we can check in next week, find out what passed and what didn't. <laughs> Yeah, I will uh, know on August 31st what's on the governor's desk and uh, governor's vetoes uh, will be, uh, let's see, the 31st will be around August 10th-ish um, where the governor uh, has to get those vetoes out to us uh, on stuff that are passing the 31st, right? I get this really confused. It was August 9th. It's 10 days, it, 10 day clock kick, clicks on the day it gets the governor's desk. So 31, so it'll be August 9th, August 10th, but mostly August 9th, there'll be a lot of action on governor's vetoes. So anything we passed this week, again, you know, going to the first couple of weeks of August. So my office, myself, will be doing a whole lot of monitoring right into the first two weeks of August to try to figure out what happens. Sounds good. Good to talk to you, Tacky, as always. As always, Joe, and uh, we'll see you in a week. 